Well, hi everyone. It's Philip Shields with Light on the Rock. You know that there are many gifts of God's Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and if you could be given the choice of having just one, which would it be? Which would you consider to be the best one, the greatest one, the most needful one for you? And why would that even matter? Well, let's talk about that today. We just finished the Feast of Pentecost a month or so ago, the, uh, 2024, the f day of first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the Holy Spirit came. And with the Holy Spirit also came the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And also, a different matter, the fruit of the Spirit. The, the fruit's interesting. There are nine listed fruit. But did you realize they're described in the singular together? The fruit, not fruits, the fruit of the Spirit is, it says. Not the fruits of the Spirit are, like everybody seems to say. It's uh, It makes for an interesting discussion, which we'll talk about again. I talked about it before. But I'm talking about, besides the fruit of the Spirit, I'm talking about the gift. But in Galatians 5, 20 to 2 to 23, there they list the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so on. Now the gifts, God's gifts are also of the Spirit. Gifts are not fruit. There are many listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 especially. The point of this teaching is this. If you could decide to have one, and that God would grant you your wish, which would it be? Which do you think is the most important one? Well, let's read some of the gifts. There are different gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12 from Romans 12 and other places, so we'll see. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 11. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 11. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. <clears throat> There are, in other words, people have different gifts, but it's still God giving them those gifts. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are differences or diversities of activities, the same God working in all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So the gift is also called the manifestation of the Spirit. It's to help everybody, profit for everybody. Verse 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. So some have a gift of wisdom, word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Maybe deeper understanding of the Scriptures or something. To another, faith. Now we all have faith. We're all given faith. There are verses that say that, but I guess some just have a greater gift of faith. To another... Someone else, not everyone, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. They just really have a good gift of prophecy. Now, a lot of people, I think, think they have the gift of prophecy, but then what they say is going to happen doesn't happen. <clears throat> so they don't. To another, discerning spirits. To another, different kinds of languages or tongues. To another, the interpretation of those tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Individually. So not everyone's going to have a gift of healing or a gift of tongues or a gift of prophecy. Individually. But that's a long list of wonderful gifts. And all of them are wonderful. There are more. If you go to Romans 12, there's different ones listed. Now, remember, a gift of the Spirit is not necessarily something you were already born with. Sometimes you have talents. Someone might say, boy, you've got a gift of singing or music or math or whatever. That's not what we're talking about today. Sometimes God may add to a natural talent that you already have, like teaching or leading but clearly these gifts of God's Spirit can be seen as something that come additionally from God. 
Maybe a gift you may not have even had so clearly before. So here's the list in Romans 12, verses 6 to 8. And this time I'll be reading from the NIV, New International Version. We have different gifts. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, whoever thought of serving as being a gift, but there are some people who just know how to serve, are real good at it, let him serve. If it's teaching, some have a gift of teaching, let him teach. <clears throat> if it's encouraging, boy, isn't that a nice gift to have? You're such an encouraging person. That's a gift. Let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him do so generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So, which of all of those would you pick? Serving, teaching, leadership, prophesying? gift of healing, gift of miracles. What's your favorite? I would be very, very surprised if most of you are praying for God to let you have much more of the gift that we'll be talking mostly about today. The greatest gift, the best gift. I wonder if all of you even pray for the gifts of God to be given to you. You should be. I believe the favorite gifts of many ministers would be to have the gift of prophecy or the gift of healing or the gift of teaching or the gift of working miracles. We sure could use more healings, more miracles. Now among Pentecostal congregations especially, the gift of tongues is highly cherished. You almost feel like you're missing out on something. People make you feel like you're missing out if you don't have it. I don't have the gift of tongues, but whether or not you agree with the way tongues are used in Pentecostal churches or those who speak in tongues, keep in mind that scripture clearly shows us that not everyone gets the same gifts. Not everyone can heal. Not everyone can work miracles or teach or prophesy. And not everyone can speak in tongues. Interestingly enough to me, speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues are always in every list listed last among the gifts. I'm not putting them down. In fact, Paul says not to forbid speaking in tongues, and Paul said that he spoke in tongues more than all of them. But he also said he'd rather speak in something people understand. That's in 1 Corinthians 14. Just remember that we're told to one is given such and such a gift, and to another something else. So keep that in mind. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 8. It's the same spirit. So let's go on. I'm going back to 1 Corinthians now, 12. Let's start now towards the end of the chapter, verse 27 to 31. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 27 to 31. <clears throat> now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church of God, and in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, okay, first, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, and then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues, again, listed last, but it's listed, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? We say, of course not. But verse 31, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Paul is teaching us there are gifts greater, more important, more impactful than others. And he goes on to say, and now I will show you the more excellent, the most excellent way. That's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. So he's going to start talking about the greater gifts. 
First, though, be, now keep that in mind. He's going to talk about greater gifts in a minute. But keep in mind that even Yeshua, Jesus, warned that it's very possible that some people can do such great preaching and miracle working that they end up, uh, and yet they end up having Jesus say to them, I never knew you. Now that would be scary to hear. I'll read the verse in Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice no law, iniquity, lawlessness. So you don't want to be practicing no law or lawlessness. And beware of someone or following someone just because they are having such great miracles into you. That's proof that God's working with them. In the very last days, which we're coming to now, if we're not already in them, remember even the great false prophet that came the, 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 to come as the Antichrist, who will sit in the very temple of God proclaiming he is God will be having such powerful miracles, such convincing miracles, that he deceives everybody and almost deceives the very elect, if it were possible. These won't be magical acts or sleight of hand. They'll be true miracles, because we're told Satan himself gives him those powers. So when you see these things happening, don't think, wow, he's got a great gift of the Holy Spirit. He might have the gift of a spirit, all right, but the spirit may be Satan. Revelation 13, verses 11 to 15, talking about the beast powers and the false prophet and all of that. Revelation 13, 11, then I saw another beast. This is going to be the false prophet. Coming up out of the earth, up out of the earth. And later, by the way, it's said that he comes out of the abyss. Now you go figure that one out and tell me what you come up with. He had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast. That's the military, economic power. And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs, okay, the second beast, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Very much like what Elijah did. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. All right, so he was granted to have these powerful signs. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 14, the signs by which he was granted to do. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 24, verses 24 and 25, I'm talking about this because some of the signs, remember, were miracles and healings and things. Matthew 24, verses 24 and 25, for false Christ, false messiahs, and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Wow. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 Paul says, the coming of the lawless one, remember Jesus said, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness, iniquity, and all that. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. With all power. But now Paul will teach us about some greater gifts. Remember in 1 Corinthians 12, the last verse, let me show you some greater gifts. Are you praying for more of these greater gifts? It's because, because without this special gift that I'm about to speak about, those who can speak in tongues or can prophesy are just making noise. 
Paul says that without the special gift of the Holy Spirit, even the ability to have so much faith that you can move an entire mountain will mean nothing. But many of us would be absolutely impressed with someone with that much faith that he could move a mountain, or she could. Paul says that could be missing the more important gift. So remember 1 Corinthians 12.31 ended with Paul talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Let's read it again. Eagerly desire the greater gifts. So that's still his topic. And now I will show you the most excellent way. So he says it's wonderful to desire the gifts of the Spirit, but desire the greatest. Desire it. Eagerly desire it. So it's not wrong or selfish to want, to desire, to eagerly desire the greater gifts. But it's not one of the ones he's mentioned before. So, the greatest gift of the Spirit. Have you been praying for more of this one? 1 Corinthians 13, the next verse. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men, verses 1, to, 1 and 2 actually. Though I speak with the tongues, the languages of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging symbol. I'm just a noisemaker. Verse 2, 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I had all faith that I could move mountains, plural. If I don't have love, I am nothing. Verse 8. Love never fails. Keep that in mind. The love we're talking about, the love of God, never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And he goes on to describe this beautiful love, godly agape love. And then in verse 13, And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these, these are gifts, remember, that's the context. The greatest of these is love. So there it is. How many of you have been praying for more of God's love? The greatest gift you can ask for more of, and should greatly desire, Paul said, is more of God's love. Love is also the first listed fruit of God's ninefold spirit. Fruit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. The first one mentioned is love. But it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of our striving to become more loving. That's the fruit of your works. This is the fruit, a gift from God and a fruit. The kind of love we must have is God's love and it comes from God. God's love is something God gives through the Holy Spirit. All the translations say this kind of love comes to us from God. Romans 5.5 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the, whole, by the Holy Spirit given to us. I think that's probably... No, that is New King James. Okay, I think... The love of God has been poured out in our hearts. The King James, I believe, says has been shed abroad in our hearts. So be sure you understand. Be sure you understand the wording simply as most translations put it. God has poured out into our hearts his very own love. 
the love of God. This is the greatest gift that God gives from the Holy Spirit, God's own love. Now, several huge points come to mind as to why this is so important to understand. Keep several of these huge points in mind. First of all, in the end time, Jesus warned us that the love of many will wax cold, as the King James puts it, grow cold. People, as a rule, will become ever increasingly more unloving and will be attacking us viciously. It's going to be hard to love them when they've killed your mom or your wife, though we're told to love our enemies. This is something about God's love. It's, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't end. It doesn't change. But notice what Jesus said in Matthew 24, all of that prophecy, verses 9 to 14. I'll read again from the NIV here. Matthew 24, 9 to 14. Then you will be handed over to the persecuted, to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. So if any of you believe that all of God's people will be raptured up, never have to face this, Jesus says you will be handed over and persecuted and killed and hated. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most, King James, I says many there, the love of most will grow cold. The love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. We must not let that be describing you and me. Letting God's love in us grow cold. We, God's children, must keep our love red hot, even when we're being attacked. We don't want to be cooling down to lukewarm like Laodiceans. He says in Revelation 3, verses 14 to 15, that that lukewarmness that they had make, made him sick to his stomach, made him feel like he had to vomit. He wanted to vomit. I don't want God feeling like he wants to vomit when he thinks of me or you. So the first one's a warning that the end time love will wax cold, grow cold. God's two greatest commands, according, here's the second thing, according to the Son of God, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? The two greatest commands are both about love. Love God with all your being, heart, soul, and mind, and your whole being. The second one is like it, but the love for fellow mankind. Love others as yourselves. And that should be our answer if someone were to ever ask you, what are the main things your church believes? How would you answer that? The main thing we believe, frankly, is not the Seventh-day Sabbath, as many of you would jump to answer with that answer. It's not that. It's not what Jesus said. And it's certainly not about not eating pork or lobster. Our main belief is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's all about God and all about his love for us. He embodies love. He is love. That one word is what he is. Sure, God's also the creator. He's God most high. He's everlasting father. And all of that and more. But all of that is about his love. And we stress that our belief is that we must live with such a deep love back to God and for each other that people are amazed. That's what Jesus said, remember, the two greatest commandments. And we explain that we love him because he first loved us. He died for us while we were still sinners. Another point, this love for one another should be so strong that when people meet us and come to our church services, 
it should be so strong that they're blown away by the loving concern, the attentiveness, the caring that they sense in all of the people there. They're experiencing Jesus in each person. This is one of the biggest signs Jesus gave that we would be his disciples. That we have this profound love for one another just as Christ does for us. We love, we forgive, we reconcile even with those who've hurt us or have disappointed us badly or did bad things. We love and reconcile, we forgive as soon as they repent. And yet remember that Jesus, by the way, he was asking God the Father to repent, I mean to forgive those who were crucifying him and doing all those horrible things before they ever repented. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If we don't love, neither will we be able to forgive and reconcile. But if that happens, that we can't forgive and reconcile with those who have offended us, frankly, frankly, neither will we be forgiven by God according to Jesus' own words after the sample Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you forgive others, okay? Verse 15, but if you do not forgive men, their trespasses. Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow! If our Heavenly Father won't forgive us, that means we're still in our sin and headed for the lake of fire. It's that simple. It's that simple. Or we can accept God's love and forgive others who hurt us and reconcile with them as, and we'll be forgiven and reconciled as well. It's one, it's one aspect of love is, is to forgive and reconcile. We need to prove we have this God level kind of love by demonstrating God's love to everyone, even our very enemies. We need to prove it by reconciling with those we've offended or who have offended us. We need to forgive, even if we, even if the same person comes to you seven times, same person, seven times with another offense against you. Even Jesus said, if they come even seven times in one day, forgive. You know why he said that? Because I find myself going to God many times in a week, certainly sometimes several times in a day. Asking him to forgive me for whatever, sin or impatience or getting angry, too angry or whatever. Romans 8.39 says to us in the new covenant that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Now, the old covenant, yeah, when you sin, your, your sins cut you off from God. In the new covenant... Nothing can separate us now from the love of Christ. And that's the way we must become more and more with other people. We must become more and more like God, like Christ is. We love them no matter what. No matter what. Why is love listed first in the fruit of the Spirit? Why is love called the greatest gift of God's Spirit? Because love is what it's all about. Love is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. Love is what God is all about. Love is what God's way, God's kingdom, and God himself are all about. And love is what we're supposed to be all about. When we preach the gospel, ultimately it's all about God's love for mankind in restoring God's kingdom and saving all humanity. 
That's why the Apostle John focused on love in the Epistle of John. I want to read some of those. Remember again, you know, human love will come and go. You've lost that loving feeling, you know, and it's gone, gone, gone. And please release me, let me go, for I don't love you anymore, these old songs. <clears throat> God's love doesn't come and go like that. It's just simply there. That's why we need God's love. Let's read some of John's inspired writings about God's love. 1 John 4, verses 7 to 13. Beloved, let us not love... I mean, sorry, let us love one another. Love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love, including forgiving and reconciling and being kind and all those things, he who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, 1 John 4, 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time, God the Father. If we love one another, God abides in us. God lives in us when we love one another. And his love has been perfected in us. Verse 16, we've known and believed the love of God that God has come for, that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. You see why this is such a, the greatest gift? Verse 19, verse 17 and 18 are fabulous verses too. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who doesn't love his brother whom he's seen, how can he, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Must love his brother also. Wow, must. All the signs of love are in full action. I'd advise you go back and read 1 Corinthians 13, all of it. Describes love, how it's patient, never seeks its own, isn't proud. So are you praying for more love? I'll bet many of you prayed for the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, the gift, the gift of understanding the word, and the gift of teaching, or the gift of this or that, the gift of tongues. How many of you have been praying for the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit? The greatest of these is love. It's by experiencing the love of God that men will know we are his disciples. As they see us forgiving and reconciling with former enemies and loving even our foes. If any of you had a hard time forgiving and reconciling, let me be clear. You need much, much more of God's love and it won't be so hard. You don't have this godly love yet in enough quantity if you can't enjoy one another, even those who have hurt you badly in the past. I've had many people hurt me badly in the past. I've had to thank God for them and lessons learned from them and that I would also in turn love them no matter what. When people come visit in your congregations, besides all the other gifts, the greatest gift that they should sense is the abundance, is the incredible, indescribable abundance of love. 
we're all having for one another. This gift is more important than anything else. Having God's love <clears throat> is more important than healing, than preaching, than prophesying, than speaking in tongues, than miracles, than sharing and giving, than anything else. When visitors leave you and go back home, hopefully they're still talking about the amazing love they experienced in your congregation and with you. Remember how at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul said he wanted to show us the best gift. Here it is again, 1 Corinthians, and he said, desire. In 1 Corinthians 12, he said, these are the gifts you should greatly desire. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. If your Bible says charity, it means love, okay? Of course, love is the greatest of all. Love is what God is. He's the greatest of all. Love is what he wants us to be as well. God is love. He wants you to be love. He wants me to be love. Father in heaven, we just bow our head to, to you, our Father, and just ask you, in Jesus' name, our Savior, help us understand this is the most important gift of the Spirit. We pray that you will pour out this love into our hearts in abundance, that we will show an affection, a love, a joy with each other, even those who've been bad to us. We pray that we will never, ever lose that love, no matter what people do to us, including death, to our loved ones. We will still love them. As you, Jesus, loved them enough to ask your Father, our Father, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Help us be like you, Jesus. Yeshua, our Savior, let us be like you. And you are perfectly, exactly like Father. Father, we love you. Help us love you more. Come into our life with your love. Help us reconcile with those who have been separated from us. Help us forgive and help us be happy even with those who have done us wrong. I need it too, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.